There's a U.S. Air Force uniform that hangs in my closet. It doesn't belong to me. It belonged to my dad. You see, my dad served in the U.S. Air Force during World War II. He was a senior at the University of Wisconsin. He was this close to graduating when Uncle Sam called him up and said, I need you to help fight the Nazis in Germany. And so Dad had to put his education on hold and go fight for Uncle Sam. On the uniform, there's a silver bar on one collar, and that shows his rank as a, as a lieutenant. On the other collar are his wings, and in the center of the wings are a little brass propeller. On one sleeve is the blue patch that's the emblem of the mighty 8th Air Force. It was the 8th Air Force that did all the bombing deep into Germany using the heavy bombers, the B-17s and the B-24s, in the latter stages of the war. And they had a huge mortality rate. It was much safer to be in the U.S. Marines or the U.S. Army than to be on a heavy bomber going all the way from England to Germany to drop bombs. Because you were exposed for hundreds of miles to attack by the Nazis. By the time they got all the way into Berlin or or Hamburg, or Bremen, or whatever city in Germany, the Germans had known for hours that they were coming. And they were assaulted with deadly ferocity. As part of a crew, Dad had crewmates about him. And the crewmates all traveled together as they were trained on how to work a B-24. So over the, over the course of the training, they spent some time in Texas at gunnery school. They spent some time in New Mexico learning how to navigate. And the reason for this is that if your waste gunner was killed in the middle of, of one of your missions, that anybody else could step up and man that gun because they all knew how to run the gun. So they, everyone was cross-trained in how to do various things. At one point, he was of all place in Mountain Home, Idaho. Here he was born and raised in Madison, Wisconsin. He'd never been to Idaho. And he thought, Mountain Home, Idaho. Oh man, I'm finally going to get to see the Rocky Mountains. This is going to be great. And when he landed there and he saw sagebrush and a flat little city, he was like a little bit disappointed, I think. But while he was there at Mountain Home, my mom came out on a train. And Mom and Dad were married at St. John's Cathedral on Hay Street in the north end of Boise. What's that got to do with this story? Well, many years later, I was a TV director in San Luis Obispo, California. And I was offered a job to work at KTVD Channel 7. And I moved to Boise. And when I met my wife-to-be, she lived three doors down in that church. You know, life has a pretty good sense of humor sometimes. But now let's go back to 1944. Dad was in a B-24, which looked like this, had that distinctive H-shaped tail. There were really only two planes in World War II that the Americans used that had the size and strength and could hold enough fuel to fly the hundreds of miles from England all the way into the very middle of Germany to drop thousands of tons of bombs. And they were the B-24 Liberator and the more famous B-17 Flying Fortress. Dad was on the Liberator. Every time they were up there, the Germans were shooting at them. Every time Dad was deployed on a mission, he knew he might not come back alive. I tried to think about that. What must that have felt like? He was a 21-year-old young man, and he didn't know from day to day if he was going to survive. He didn't know from day to day if he was ever going to see his bride again. That must have been really, really tough. And on many missions, one or more people on the crew would either be injured or killed. And finally, on the 18th or 19th mission, 
almost everybody on the flight was killed, including the pilot, who had been my dad's best friend and had been his best man at his wedding in Boise. And so now my dad became a floater, and he was used on other crews that needed a bombardier or a navigator. And so on his 20th mission, he was in with guys that he didn't know. It had been like he had been serving with his band of brothers. They all loved each other. They spent all their time together, playing cards. Um, when they could go off base, they'd go to see movies and, and, and go to London to be entertained by whatever shows might be in London. Now he's with guys he didn't even know, much less feel brotherly towards. And it was his 20th mission. Why is that important? Because you had to serve 30 missions to be sent home to America. The problem was, almost nobody made it to 30 missions before being killed. And that's why the Memphis Bell became kind of famous, is that was the first plane to finally make it through 30 missions and come home. And if they tried to play that up in the press to give the young men who were who were serving in the Air Force a little more hope that they would come home alive too, because most crews did not make it home. So for this 20th mission, he was with a new crew, and they volunteered to be the lead plane. Well, the lead plane's at the front of the V, and it leads all the other planes towards the target. And the Germans liked to always target that lead plane, because if they could shoot that one down, other pilots could get confused, could get out of formation, and then they got picked off a lot more easily than if they were in formation. So why in the world would you volunteer for that? Because if you had ever flown on a plane that had flown as the lead plane, you could go home after 25 missions. And they were on their 20th, meaning if they got through this one alive, they only had to fly five more, and oh boy, they were heading back home to good old USA. Their target for this mission was Hamburg. And Hamburg is the only port city in Germany. So that's where they built all of their battleships, destroyers, and submarines, and where they launched them off. And they knew that the Allies were going to bomb it heavily. And so it was well fortified. So there were flak guns. This is a flak gun. And flak guns shot these huge steel shells that were full of powder. And they would preset at what elevation they would explode. And then at that elevation, preset elevation, the shell would explode, and it would turn into spinning shards of steel. And that steel would cut through the aluminum of the American bombers, like a can opener for a can of tuna fish. What it did to flesh and bone was beyond horrific. This is actually one of the fortifications from Hamburg. This wasn't seen in all cities. American bombers hated having just go to Hamburg because they knew they were going to go over these, which had four flat guns, one at each of the four corners, and they were super big flat guns, and they could shoot shells four miles into the air. Four miles. The B-24s could not fly above that. They didn't yet have planes that were pressurized with oxygen like we do, do, do today when we get on airliners. So they were up there and a lot of people serving on the crews would get a frostbite on toes and on fingers because it would be 30, 40, 50 degrees below zero. And they have, would have an oxygen mask so that they could breathe, but it wasn't pressurized. So on this mission, Their plane was hit by flak. This is not my dad's plane. I don't have a good photo of my dad's plane after it was hit by flak. But this shows the damage that's done. Clearly, when you have steel against thin aluminum, steel wins. And the first thing they knew is they knew there's no way we're going to be able to get back from the northern point of Germany all the way back to southern England to our air base with a plane that's this damaged. 
So we've got to come up with an alternative. What are we going to do? So what they decided to do was to fly across from Germany to Sweden, which was a much shorter flight. And the reason they chose Sweden is because Sweden was a neutral country in World War II. And as odd as it sounds, there are rules in war, even a war as barbaric and vicious as World War II. And there are rules for being a neutral country. And so if you land in a neutral country, whether you were a Nazi or an American or whether you were English, you had to be held by that country until the end of the war. They could not allow you to go back and continue fighting. Otherwise, you could lose your status as a neutral country. They crash landed in Sweden on a runway that was much too short for a B-24. When they crash landed, the co-pilot broke his back, and the next day, he died. The rest of the guys survived, and for them, the war was over. But they were held by the Swedes. Now, this wasn't anything like a prisoner of war camp like you've seen in movies. There were no machine gun nests, there was no barbed wire, no guard dogs, but they had to stay there. Meanwhile, my mom is wondering if her husband is, is alive or dead from day to day. I often wonder which would be the worst role to have. And she's notified by the Department of War that her husband is MIA, missing in action. Must have been a terrible, terrible experience for her. Until they allowed them to send telegrams home. And Dad's was just three words. Emma Live Carl. And I'm sure she was just overcome with joy when she heard that. But still, she had probably wondered, but is he hurt? Is he crippled? Is he handicapped? You know? So at, that, at some point, the Swedes allowed them to send a picture of themselves home. And my dad had bought himself a sweater in Sweden, because Sweden's up by the Arctic Circle, like Alaska. It's very, very cold there in the wintertime. And there were reindeer on the sweater, as you see here. And in his picture, he was wearing this sweater. Well, before the letters could be mailed home, they had to go through the military censors in Sweden. And the job of the military censors was to make sure that none of the flyers were sending information back home that could be relayed to the War Department or the Air Force that could help them know where these guys were at. Because if they knew, they could try to send in some people to rescue them so that they could put them back in England and put them back to work in the war. And they couldn't do that. So the censors saw this sweater and they said, wait a second, this thing's got reindeer all over it. And Sweden is the only neutral country in the war that has reindeer in it. And we have lots of reindeer. We're famous for our reindeer. So this guy could be trying to send a message back to America that he's in Sweden. We can't allow that. So they took out scissors and they cut out his whole body, his whole torso. And my mom gets this, gets this picture of my dad's floating head with his, the rest of his body cut out. And again, I'm thinking, what must she have thought? I'm sure she was gratified to see that his head was okay, but she must have thought, why'd they cut out his body? What's wrong with his body? Must have been very difficult. Thankfully, at this point, the war in Europe was almost over. It was only about another six months before the Russians stormed Berlin, before Hitler committed suicide, and the Nazis surrendered unconditionally. Mom and Dad were able to have a joyous reunion. They went on to raise five boys, of which I am the third. They were kind and loving parents. My dad was a kind and loving dad. And as I look back on this and think about the guts and the courage it must have taken him to go up there day after day and see his buddies shot, bleeding to death, 
decapitated in some instances. To watch that and to come out of this as a normal person, a person who cared about others, a person who could be kind and generous to others, a person who loved his wife, a person who loved his five sons, and who did everything he could for us to be a good dad, and to provide for us, and to help us have a good life and a good future. If he could go through that and not come out crazy and be that normal and that kind of loving, then I thought, what right do I have to complain about the problems and trials I have in my life? Let's face it, we all have trials and problems in life. But I never, when I was 21 years old, had people trying to kill me. My dad did. And so as I look at that uniform hanging in the closet, it's not just the medals I look at. I think about my dad. He died more than 10 years ago. I miss him terribly. I still think about him just about every day. And I feel like he's still alive in my heart. And a lot of times I think, gee, I wish dad were here. I wish I could ask him more about what happened in the war. But more importantly, I wish I could ask him, Dad, can you help me understand what I need to know to be a better husband? Can you tell me what I need to know to be a better father to my kids? I'd love to hear those things from him. But you know what? Since he was good at both, what I can do is I can look back at the example he set, and I can try to follow that example. And when I see that uniform hanging in the closet, it reminds me that not only was he my dad and a great dad, he was also my hero. I hope that you enjoyed my speech. Thank you very much for listening.